Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to episode number 15 of the Lessons in Leadership podcast. Um, brought to you by www.markpetipod.com because when you can't find a sponsor, you sponsor your own show, right? <laughs> on that note, um, we're going to have some markpetipod.com clients on the call today, uh, the podcast. And this is a first. It's a first where I've done a group. Um, and so it'll be interesting how this goes. But I would love to introduce you to these three amazing people that are on the call today. So for those of you who are not watching the video, but that can hear this, yes, there's three. Uh, I'm the fourth. That's not an amazing person, by the way. Uh, a little bit of background. So the three of these owners uh, run a company out of Guelph in North York currently that's growing called View Cube Vision Therapy. Not View 3, View Cube Vision Therapy. Um, and I know because I've made that mistake myself. Great start, eh, with new clients. Um, but I have really... I've come to love these three and their entire team. I don't tell them that very often, but I have come to love the three of you. Um, and I just think your journey's so cool. I think it's cool for multiple reasons. Um, one, what you do, period. Um, and I had to learn what vision therapy even was. I didn't even know it existed. And, and I think a significant portion of the population that could use your services don't know it exists either. And, and that's part of the challenge is getting out there so you guys can impact some more lives. So certainly thought it was unique to talk about your business, but more importantly, as three entrepreneurs, um, that leadership path for the three of you is, is literally in the business you're building, right? So a lot of my guests have kind of come up and been a supervisor and then a manager, and then they were a director, and then they were a vice president, and then they became a president. You guys know where, boom, right to owner. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that and, and the influences you have and on your lives and, and how's that maybe impacted your leadership styles and certainly what's important, most important to you as leaders and how you could share some lessons with other entrepreneurs going through the same journey. So that's it. That's the, probably the last we're going to hear of me. They're both, they're all laughing because they know I never shut up. Um, but I'm going to try and ask some questions and get some responses. So I introduced to you today, the three owners of UQ vision therapy, Steph Bodet, Dan Cunningham and Dr. Patrick Quaid. Dr. Dan Cunningham, Dr. Patrick Quaid. It's that boy. Dan's going on and off. All those years, what happened? Just like that. Um, before I, I, I let each of you introduce you and introduce yourselves and what you do in the organization, we got to start with a pint. So I'll go first. I am drinking because I'm in was like a beach now. A local berry beer called Juicy Ass IPA. <laughs> Just interesting. Uh, made by Flying Monkey, and it's actually a great beer. Doctor yeah, Quaid, what are you having? I'm having good old fashioned Sleeman Original. Ah, uh, Guelph Homebrew. business, Guelph beer. I like it. That's right. Doctor uh, Doctor Cunningham. Another Guelph beer. I'm drinking a Wellington SPA here. Nice, just north of Highway Six. I love it. Or actually, yes, on kind of Highway Six, isn't it? No. Um, I'm spilling beer here already. I haven't had any today. I swear to God. And <laughs> Steph, the pre well, the pre what was that, Dan? Sorry. Just the pre party. Yeah, no kidding. It started at nine this morning, obviously. Steph, right I, actually, I was working with you guys. You were my client this morning, so I didn't start drinking at nine. I think about were it. Were we? <laughs> you were, just not you directly. Steph, what are you having? I went to Toronto for some steam whistle. Nice. Good beer. Good beer. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, Steph, why don't we start with you? Tell, tell the audience a little bit about yourself and what you do at UQ Vision Therapy. Um, everything. Uh, <laughs> everything. Well, we just covered <laughs> off Dan and Pat. They do nothing. You do all of it. That's great. Well, no, I'm not a doctor, so I can't do that part. Right. But someone has to take care of the doctors. Yeah, that's me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not really, just these two. Um, I don't know how to say, I kind of do, I have my hand in everything. I oversee all of the departments. I am the head of two of the departments that I oversee. And Dan is the department head of the other one that I oversee. So I spend most of my time talking to Dan uh, and myself because, you know, department heads of two departments that I oversee. So um no, I guess I just mainly I, my my function that I really see it as is more guiding and supporting and helping people work through problems and 
um, making sure that everybody else, everybody in the company is aligned to the vision and the mission of what we're actually trying to achieve. So I'd say when I do end up talking to the team, which I typically talk to um, at least Mandy, uh, one of our essential people, uh, a couple times a week is making sure that she's aligned and that she knows what she's doing and helping her and supporting her. And that's, I think, the biggest role that any of us can really have because we aren't on the ground. So making sure that the people that are going to be in charge of the people that are on the ground um, are actually supported and aligned and feel cared for ultimately is what it is. And then I do the back end financials and all that fun stuff. But uh, I said that's probably my most important thing. Yeah, I get to witness it firsthand, the, the, the people leadership side, but I, I've always, all, often said this, I've worked with some pretty impressive CFOs um, in some big companies. And honestly, the control you have over your data and how your business is run is impressive. So you're kind of underplaying that one a little bit for those of you listening. Um, she already owns a company, so she's going nowhere, but she could be a CFO <laughs> for sure. I, I love Excel. Uh, it's a giant joke within our company. I love Excel. Uh, I will put everything into Excel if I can. Uh, and uh, the amount of spreadsheets and data that we have is is excessive. Yeah, the, the differentiator for you is you actually know the behaviors that drive the data. And that's not common. Yes. Let's not yes. underplay that one. Awesome. Thank you for that, Steph. Um, Dan, you cannot start by reminding me that the wings beat the halves. Okay, let's. Oh, you already <laughs> did that. So. <laughs> Other than that, tell us about you. Can I go back to how we ran Patrick Watt of Montreal? No, that's not. Oh, I just got oh, it. I already did. <laughs> uh, so you wanted me to talk about what I do. Now. Mm -hmm. uh, like I talk to staff a lot. Um, <laughs> technically, I'm the, the director of operations, which means I oversee our uh, therapeutic services, our VT team, that's vision therapists in each location. We have a lead VT in each location that I have uh, weekly one-on-ones with to make sure that they uh, are feeling supported, that they understand where we're trying to head. There's clarity and alignment on what we're trying to do. And we're trying to do the give the best patient care that we can to help our patients remove their visual barriers from their life so that they can get back to school, learning, reading better, um, playing their sports if they need to, um, those sorts of things. Um, I'm also a doctor of optometry, fellowship trained, so I see patients as well. Um, and uh, I don't think it's a director level role anymore, but for some reason I get all the IT problems. And I think it's because I know how to Google. You're so good at them. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I know how to type Google searches pretty well, basically. Well, well there you go. You're, you're, you're halfway there. I'm just teasing any of you executives in IT listening to this podcast. There's more to it. <laughs> Awesome. And by the way, this is not important because we're trying to have a professional podcast. Red Wings suck. Dr. Quay. <laughs> here's awesome. what I'd ask. Here's what I'd ask of you, if you don't mind. You're, you're the founder. Um, you've got quite a significant background in your practice. I'd love if you could introduce us to you, but also tell me why you started QQ Vision Therapy and what is vision therapy for those who have never heard about it before listening to this podcast. And by the um, way, we only have an hour, Pat. <laughs> I keep it short and succinct. So I'll talk about my current role first, very briefly. So I'm uh, director of optometric services. So I oversee the optometrists and make sure they feel supported. Uh, we're all on the same team in terms of uh, the target demographic that we think we can deliver the best with and also doing outreach and making sure we get the name of you out there with the help of you, of course, Mark, who's doing a fantastic job for us. You can pay me later. Um, I, I think the going back to why I founded it, I mean, what's vision therapy? Um, vision therapy, uh, we, we teach developing brains how to use eyes. And that's that's absolutely Dan's phrase. And thank you so much for coming up with that, because that was as doctors, we are we have a really bad habit of overcomplicating everything. Um, and, and a lot of kids who try to read, um, they can still see in terms of they can see 2020 far away on a regular eye exam, but the eye movements and the eye focusing, so what we call the dynamic visual skills are off. Um, so these kids can often be very smart verbally, but when you get them to read or copy down from a from a from a board to a page, for example, they they struggle disproportionately, uh, and that can really frustrate those kids. So the reason why I got into it is quite frankly, I was one of those kids, um, and I think for a good three year period, I was I was convinced I was stupid. Um, you know, I also had unfortunately had a speech impediment. There's a bunch of reasons behind why, but the vision issue was a last 
pretty much the last thing to get checked because if you have a speech impediment like a stammer, people hear it, so they address it. The vision issue got missed for a lot longer. So that mo- motivated me later in life to uh, via a variety of different journeys, which I won't get into here. Um, but I ended up um, going through optometry school and hoping to learn about vision therapy and learn very little about it. Um, and I ended up doing some work afterwards in terms of um, post-grad work uh, and, and eventually cross paths with people like Dan and and other people through an organization called COBD in the US and WC Maples, a bunch of other people where I think I think life takes you through different pathways for a reason. And uh, we've ended up where we are now. So I think we're quite unique in that, yes, we're optometry, we're eye care, but we don't do regular eye exams. We don't even dispense glasses. We just, we literally just teach developing brains how to use eyes. Awesome. That's, that's really great way of summing up what I've come to learn with working with you guys for the last year and a bit, which is uh, even a deeper space than how you summarized it. But I think you did a good job with that. I, I try and tell people, because I don't know the level of expertise that you guys have, obviously, but when people are asking me about my business and my clients and they talk about what they do, some of them are pretty easy, right? Like, you know, I'm working with a logistics company or I'm working with uh, Canada Soccer. Oh, I wonder what they do. Soccer, great. Uh, not to downplay that, Canada <laughs> Soccer, if you're listening to this. <laughs> Earl, the, I'm just drawing a parallel here. But um, I think... The way I try and explain it to people is like when I go and bust my MCL playing ball hockey, well, part of that journey of getting back is actually working that muscle and strengthening it. You you just can't do the surgery and say everything's fine. You've got to go and you got to take exercises and have someone who cares about your recovery take you through that path. And I didn't even know that existed for eyes. Um, and not to simplify what you do, I mean, that is a message that needs to get out to more people that that's available to them. And the impact it can have on children, um, specifically with their learning abilities, is is pretty impactful. But we'll we'll save the, hey, come check out ViewQ vision therapy stuff for another day. I'll drop my sales and marketing here. And, and let's talk a little bit more about leadership, because uh, that is do where I want to focus this conversation. I think you guys have some pretty unique stories to share that Hopefully, I'll get out of you today. We'll see. You. And Pat, it's okay to cry. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. <laughs> it's okay to cry. Um, so let, let me, let's start here. I'm going to ask a different question of each of you. And feel free to jump in if you want to comment on that question and, and, and add a little value. But you have to add value. Not like me. You can talk just for the sake of talking. Um, I'm going to start with you, Steph. Um, Who's influenced you in your leadership style, either personally or professionally in your life? Where do you, where do you think the way you lead people comes from? Um, I think the, the biggest, honestly, probably the biggest influencer in the leadership style that I have was probably actually Dan. Um, but more in terms of like actually opening up my brain to different thoughts and different abilities to actually um, look different stuff up. Like in, uh, in 2016, we, we had a rough patch in the company where I, I was probably a bit more authoritarian than I want, that I want to be now for sure. Um, and I think it really came down to at that point of you had two options. One was be vulnerable and actually learn how to change yourself and realize who you are and who you want to be. Um, and two was stick with the path and you're probably going to lose everybody and, and burn the place to the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it was around that time. And so I really started mm-hmm. looking into different com- components of uh, like personality, um, trying to figure out that kind of stuff. And then Dan, that was around the time that Dan was, So Dan has an interesting story, even coming into the company where he was actually not originally an owner and neither was I actually like Pat was the founder, Dan and I bought in later, but Dan actually was coming up from Windsor um, just to do, you know, be an independent contractor, come see patients um, and help Patrick out. And it was around the time that he really started coming on more and was talking about moving to Guelph and, and being there. And it was around the same time that we started having these issues with, uh, with our team. And so he was a part of the, no, 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 not you because of you. You just happened to be there. You were the fun uncle. Everyone's like, Dan's coming. This is awesome. Oh my God, Dan. Um, and, uh, and anyway, so it was around that same time. And so I think there was an aspect of vulnerability that was required to be able to start looking at things. And, and Patrick and I both started actually on different Simon Sinek books, not knowing that we were both reading Simon Sinek books. Yep. Um, and I started with leaders eat last Patrick started with start with why. And then 
when I said like Dan and I both kind of joked a little bit at the beginning of this thing like we talk a lot and I think what we end up talking about most of the time and have for years is just leadership and how to be better and who what other books can we read and Dan is the king of podcasts uh and I think for probably three years every day I would get a podcast from him and your um, favorite so podcast is Dan <laughs> Obviously, Mark Pettipod. My leadership with Mark Pettipod. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, I've never gotten one of those texts to me, though. It's really weird. Uh, <laughs> although he stopped doing it recently because he's starting to get more focused about what it is that he should be looking at. So that's why, Mark. That's why. Um, but uh, no, and so I honestly, it would be Dan in terms of who got me started on a journey and who do I bounce those ideas off the most um, in terms of like authors and stuff, um, the one that I think really resonates with me the most, and especially more recently, is Patrick Lencioni. Um, I really like a lot of his stuff. I like the concepts that it that it has. Um, I I've read so much stuff that they all kind of um, intermingle, so I don't really have a lot of names on that side of things. I quote Brene Brown a lot. Um, I do end up quoting her a lot. I've read your book several times because um, I do. That's available on Amazon. I can't yeah, believe that's the first book. mention of his book on this podcast. Right there. Right, there it right is. There, <laughs> there it is. Let's um, <laughs> plug. Thank you, Steph. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, no, I, in all honesty, because we had taken your servant leadership course. What was that? In uh, It was in 2020, I think. It was during the pandemic. So we did it virtually. Um, and since then, because your book, I think, had just come out at that point. Uh, when we when we started did the servant leadership thing, I was um, drunk and so, the pandemic, so I don't really remember. <laughs> I was half drunk. Remember the training? <laughs> like you were pretty. You seemed pretty coherent during our did training. I, did I invoice you guys for that? Like maybe there's some money there. No, I'm teasing. Go ahead. no, it's a, no, it's no, a blur. Good. Yeah, yeah, but. So we had done that and then you had given us all your slides because we paid for your course. So I took your slides and I've adapted your slides and I've added more content and. I've put, like, I've, I've read your book several times. I've bought your book for everybody in our company that's going through servant leadership. Say, read Mark's book. We'll do the training and, and kind of coincide in that way. So I think pulling everything together, um, it, it's all of it. And I, re I read a lot of books that also just talk about all the other books that I've read, which makes me feel like I'm actually on the right track. Like, um, I'm reading right now, How to Be a Great Boss by Gino Wickman. And they talk about a bunch of other books that I've read, which is like Good to Great by Jim Collins. Mm -hmm. And they talk about the Patrick Lencioni books and they talk about all those things. And I've read all of those things too. So yeah, that's- uh... So that's the influence of your style has been at an early stage um, and having the courage to put you on the spot and say- Yeah. Right? The well, I think they're also- that, that... Conversations to have. Yeah, and I think, well, it also took that that <clears throat> vulnerability to really look at it and go, I'm not who I want to be, right? And I think coming into it so early, like at that point, I don't know, I can't remember. I think I had just bought in at that point when everything kind of went to hell. Um, and I think it became more challenging because I would do things because I didn't know what else to do. Like I didn't really have a lot of management experience, right? And so it just kind of became like, can I do that? Like I get advice, go do that. And I go, okay, sure. Can I, is that, can I do that? Okay. Um, or I would be trying to use more of the managerial styles that might've been used on me in the past. Um, and, you know, even Dan and I all have like, we'll laugh about the mistakes that we made together. Um, and we're like, oh my God, can you believe that in 2017, we said that? Like, that is so backwards. I can yeah. believe it. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, but it's so backwards to what we believe now, right? And so- there's just so many different things about your upbringing and just the style of leadership that you might've had been exposed to as a kid that like from your parents, from your grandparents, from your teachers, from society in general, right? Like the concept of like, well, don't expect your bosses to talk to you. And if you don't hear from them, then everything must be good. Whereas as you write in your book, that's not how that is anymore. If you don't talk to people, they assume things are bad. Right. Um, and so there's just that, just that kind of like flip in, in how leadership is. And you kind of, you have to be willing to actually accept the fact that it's different and be willing to start investigating and, and reading and ideally find like-minded people that you can just sit there and bounce ideas off of and just go, hey, did you think of this and this model? And oh my goodness, what about this? And um, and poor Pat has become the guinea pig for Dan and I to do um, investigations on just different personalities. But, but in, all, in all fairness, <laughs> in all fairness, I needed a lot of fixing. We'll get back to that later. <laughs> Like, um, can I enter some Coldplay background music with fixing? 
Um, and, and again, I think that's, that's where it just becomes being willing to actually say, I don't like who, who I don't like how I'm leading and I don't like who I'm becoming and I want to change that and finding the resources to be able to do it. And the resources exist. Um, awesome. I think I, I love the fact that, you know, the reading piece, because all of you have been thrust into <laughs> senior leadership and ownership positions at the same time. Like when you started your journeys, I don't think you would have thought you had a, this many people under your influence and a business at this stage of your career, which normally is like, like I mentioned earlier, the path, little bit by little yeah. bit, you get, you get to lead two people, you get to lead four people, you get to, and, and you guys are like, well, let's just start a business and be leaders. And, and, and you have to pick that up. But where I'm going to go next, and I'll, and I'll ask Dan maybe on this one if I can, any personal influence that shows up in your leadership style? Like Steph touched on it a little bit, like your upbringing and who you learned from. Is is there anything there that shows up in your leadership style? Uh, I believe so for me personally. I mean, I can I can look back at like some family members, um, as some teachers that I had, a principal that was of my elementary school, um, the uh, the doctor who sparked my interest in vision therapy, who I consider to be kind of my mentor. Um, and, and so taking those pieces and seeing how they interact and a lot of it centers around the same type of things where like Steph was saying, but it's like the listening, the understanding, encouraging, um, a lot of positive attributes, right. And not trying to be more of that authoritarian, um, do as I say, because I'm the boss or do as I say, because I told you so, or something like that. Um. So yeah, I, I think there definitely is influences that that I glean. I'm, I tend to be more of a quiet observer of things than like an outgoing participant in things. Um, so I will sit back and kind of get a lay of the land and see like who's doing what and what am I, uh, I guess, drawn to. Um, and it, I don't think it's ever been the authoritarian style of things. It just has never made sense. It's not a part of who I am, um, yeah. And I think from a young age, for some reason, I I was able to glean like what my values were and who I was and didn't get sucked into things that didn't align with that very easily. Not that I didn't, I'm sure I did. If but there's any friends that have stories from high school, please don't tell them. Yeah. <laughs> if you do have stories from high school, please do tell them. Yes. I'll give you... Please, please call in. We'll put you on a... media yeah, 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 exactly. You get your own separate podcast. Done. <laughs> call me. I will listen to that. And, 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 and before we move on, Pat, from your perspective, anything from a professional or personal thing that you kind of look at yourself now, now and go, yeah, that person influenced me positively. Are you asking Dan, sorry, or me? Sorry, Pat, did I say Dan? Oh, yeah, no, it's like, <laughs> like, yeah. like swear to God, How many beers that. do you had? <laughs> my first, okay, it's Friday. Um, professionally and personally, I would say, you know, personally, probably one of the bigger influencers was my uncle. Um, so he was he was a quiet guy, and it's funny, it's kind of like Dan. He's very introspective, very quiet. Um, because I think probably the three people who had influence on me was my dad, my uncle, and Dan. Um, and WC Maples, who's one of my mentors as well, had a really big influence on me, but I think, um, John Flanagan's to some extent too, but we'll get there. But, but I think the, um, in some ways I also had people who influenced me the wrong way, who approached things from an authoritarian standpoint, because after high school, I did some time in the military and that's very structured, very authoritarian, very do as I say, cause it's what I'm telling you to do. So I think there was some of that influence too, but I think from a, um, from a positive influence, I definitely think, uh, my uncle, cause he used to play chess a lot. He's one of these quiet guys. And if you sat down and play chess with him, he'd give you these little life pearls, which, you know, I was probably 10 and too young to understand most of them, but he would, he would throw out these isms every now and again where you know he would you know he would uh he, he would always come out with just wise statements about when you got older you're like ah he was right like you know like there's you know um one of the things he always said is you know the uh the the bulls and the bears always make money at some point but the hogs always get killed don't be greedy right and it was one of those these lines that he threw out and i thought oh like he's got some really wise words that probably 90 percent of the stuff he told me just went because i was like 10 but he was he was a really good influence on me cool and some of that will stick with you, right? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, sorry uh, Dan. Yeah. Well, no, it was just, I wanted to make a point. So like when I said one of my teachers, there was my grade six teacher, his name was Marty Haluka. 
Um, and he was actually the leader of our local um, cadets organization. And, um, and so I joined cadets because I really liked Mr. Haluka. I did not belong in cadets. I was like, <laughs> I, I can't picture you in cadets. Six months in cadets. And I was like, nope, can't do it. Yeah. I'm not tenacious enough to polish my boots that shiny or stand up in attention that long. And But he still had What's a great- What's the purpose career. of this? I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> so when Pat had mentioned the military, I was like, oh yeah, no, that's that's not, could not, not do it. But this Marty Haluka, I felt like still had those same listening, understanding, encouraging in the classroom. And then he had this different persona as the leader of the cadet troop where I was like, I don't like this, Mr. Haluka. <laughs> <laughs> That's, and and I, I find, I don't know, from my perspective, I find you find, I find you find, there we go. I find the sweet spot is when you can be authentically yourself at work. Yes. And, and yes. There's no, you know, I had one leader tell me, you know, I have TV lives. One, the people I, you know, and, and I've heard a lot of people say this. So in fairness to that gentleman, he's not the only one. You know, the life I lead, and no one at work will know that. The life I want people to think I lead, and that's <laughs> a separate TV life. And the life I want people to think they will want to lead based on the way. <laughs> and I was just like, how about Damn. you fucking self? That's complicated. <laughs> oh, and like again even within our within our team right like there's just kind of a joke of like if you talk to dan and steph like together especially but alone like you're gonna get the keys to the kingdom like we're gonna tell you probably more than you asked to the point where you might need an escape route to get out of our office um <laughs> because somebody <laughs> hey how's the company doing? well you want the long answer or the short answer and we're gonna tell you probably everything um now people don't always just come to you and ask you those types of questions right but um again to your point of just being being your true self right it's like no people are people at work that know about my personal life they're going to know the truth about my personal life um and I, there's no point in hiding it like there's obviously certain personal aspects that you're not going to like really of course. Hide of course. <laughs> but like just generic you know this is my life and i'm not ashamed of that right like well, and it, it puts you it puts you in a more comfortable position that your core to lead but it also yeah. makes it easier for people to understand who they're dealing with. And yeah. what we forget a lot of times is just as much as we're trying to figure out our teams and their behavior and help them succeed. And are they really listening? And what's their body language saying? And all this diagnosis stuff, they're doing the exact same thing with us. Mm -hmm. and, yep. and the more you pretend to be someone you're not, the less they can read into you because they can sense it. Um, so let's kind of, Drift from there on to the next point, because now we've kind of got a background of who you are, who's influenced you, what you do at work. How are you implementing your desired work environment and your leadership focus with your team? So like, talk a little bit about, you know, you guys have a growing team. How do you plan to grow it through your people? And what are some of the core um, initiatives and programs you have to make sure everyone can follow along that growth how are you leading basically within your organization no one okay <laughs> Does it go? I have the answer? like what what what, is, what what are you trying to accomplish with your team you can't all go at once you get muted out <laughs> so in the in the eyes of um, all the staff members in the two clinics, what do you want them to feel when they're at work? Ultimately, I want them to feel empowered. I, I want them to, I, I do believe that your organization is not, cannot move quickly unless, sorry, what's the, what's the expression? It can only move as fast as the, like as, as many people can say yes in your organization. Um, the way the actual phrase goes talks about more from a hierarchy perspective, like you can only move as quickly as the lowest person can say yes. I don't like the way that sounds personally. It just makes it sound very like you're the lowest and that's not true. Um, and so like, I don't, I'm not a fan of, of the concept of, oh, I can't, I have to talk to management. Um, like if, if we're talking about like an administrator or a therapist thing, you know, I have to talk to management. Well, doing that says two things. One, it tells the person that you don't have the answer, right? And, and I, ultimately I want you to have the, the power in that relationship because otherwise they're just going to bypass you every time. <clears throat> because they don't believe that you can actually do anything. So it's not just about telling people, don't say management. It's about actually empowering the people to be able to answer the question that if somebody says, well, what about this? Or I want to talk to a supervisor. Look, I'm telling you, I have the ability, I have the authority to make this call. Like, um, and ideally that 
not ideally. And the way that our company should and does work is that you go talk to a supervisor and they will back you. Um, I worked at Roots when I was a teenager. And I remember like I was a supervisor and basically the general rule of thumb was throw the employees under the bus. They're going to hold up the, they're going to hold up the, um, the policy, no refunds on boxing day. Let's get an example, right? Inevitably people show up on box and they want refunds and the cashiers would say, no, I'm sorry. There's no, there's no refunds on boxing day. And I, let me talk to a manager and then the manager would come over and give them a refund. Mm. Like, and so to me, I'm always, I've always had an issue with that style of leadership where I'm going to throw you under the bus. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't, I won't. Um, even if I, even if I disagreed with something that you did, I will back you publicly and I will talk to you privately. Um, because now depending, right. If you robbed the company, I'm not going to back you publicly. I'm going to probably, <laughs> like, there's a bit of a difference. <laughs> um, but like, you know, and I, Mandy is the person that reports to me the most. And I would say that her and I have such an honest relationship when it comes to things that there is no, um, no hiddenness. Like I, there's no pretense and I prefer that. Right. Um, there's just, it's just an honest vulnerability that's able to have a conversation and a dialogue going both ways. And that's really important to me because then there's a high level of trust. Um, and I'm a person that really values trust. So looking at that from a leadership perspective of going, okay, the people that report to me and the people that report to Mandy, I trust them. Uh, mm. And to me, that's really important. And I also want to make sure that they are empowered to be able to say yes on, on every level. Um, or to be able to just make their own decisions if they can. And if they need help and guidance and support, I will do that. Um, but I also, I've heard Mandy in a meeting two weeks ago, one of her people kind of came to her and said, you know, I, I, it's a situation and I don't really, I don't like it. And kind of going, I don't want to have this conversation with a patient. And Mandy was like, well, what do you want to do then? And her person told her, this is what I want to do with it. And they said, okay, make it happen then. Um, and she wasn't going to fight it. And it didn't, it wasn't, it's also one of those things. It's not a big enough, you know, hit to the company that Mandy's going to fight her person going, look, if that makes you feel more comfortable then yes, go do that. That's fine. Um, and so having that ability for people to, to say yes. And I think it, it goes the same on the VT side. Um, and I'll let Dan kind of go into that more too, but, um, yeah, for me, it just becomes that, that honesty and that ability to have those tough conversations without having them to be awkward. And empowering <clears throat> your employees and supporting yeah. them that empowerment, by the way, yeah. if anyone from Roots is listening to this call, I wasn't going to call you for business anyway. <laughs> Wait, call, call Mark. <laughs> I'm sure it's step you meant to say it happens in all retail companies, not just. I'm sure it happens in all retail companies. <laughs> I, right. know it I had a good experience there. I just want to say that, right? Oh, I did too. On a whole, I loved working there and I have tons of sweaters that I still own. Oh, there goes um, a fucking $100,000 contract with Roots. I was about to sign. <laughs> you can edit that out. <laughs> I don't edit anything. That's a rule. Uh, oh, wow. Uh -oh. Unless you tell me to. It's not getting edited out. I'm just teasing. Well, if you want to contact with Roots, you might want to. <laughs> I'm they're, they're amazing people. Roots, call me. They are. They're great. They call me, yeah. Canadian, <laughs> yeah. Cool. Anyway. Dan, Pat. <laughs> I have so many Roots sweaters. Dan or Pat, thoughts on, on, on what you're trying to establish and, and, and create that environment where your team will thrive through your leadership? Yeah, go ahead, Dan. That was a great way to volunteer and meet Pat. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> um, Oh man, I, I think it becomes what we're trying to achieve is I want, along the lines of what you were saying, Mark, I want people to be able to be their authentic selves here. Now, there's always a level of professionalism that we have to maintain because we're dealing with the public and we're doctors and we have, you know, we have to keep that level high, basically. Um, <clears throat> but I think um, one of the things that's having a big influence on us now, and it's, you know, one of the, the books we've read on our journey is Patrick Lencioni's Working Genius. Um, and it's kind of like a personality assessment type, but it's, it's basing us, basically helping us to understand where people get energized, what parts of a project, the beginning brainstorming, the processing of it and discerning, is this the right answer? Or like the executing and enabling people, on, not executing people, that sounded bad. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> enabling people and executing the task. <laughs> yeah. Different company. Yeah, different company. Um, but but I think the more it's, it's, it's a relatively simple structure to be able to look at it. It helps people instantly understand 
maybe why they're drawn to doing certain things, right? Um, so when I was talking about the tenacity of shining my boots, some people love that stuff and God bless them because mm -hmm. we need them, mm -hmm. right? And so, but if I put you in a job that requires more like strategic thinking and less of the tactical type of stuff, you might be very unhappy and then you're not going to get the fulfillment out of our out of our job. So part of our job is to be able to figure out, do we have the right people in the right role? Do they Do they fit our values for what we value as a company? Because if that's not a value fit, then we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna butt heads a lot. I don't want to butt heads with you. It took me quite a while to actually understand when people say um, like the higher to your values and like slowly hire but be quick to fire and release people, not fire them necessarily, but let them go back out into the world so they can find a job. And I was like, that sounds kind of fluid, but now I understand that if you're in a position that we hired for because we thought you'd be a good fit but you don't actually get fulfillment and enjoyment out of that. It's a disservice to you. It's a disservice to us. And ultimately ends up being a disservice to the people that we're trying to serve as our patients. And so trying to get those things to come together in a way that actually helps us to move together as a group is actually really challenging. Right. And it takes a lot of explanation. <clears throat> And there's, you know, it takes seven times for somebody to hear a message for the first time. And you probably have to repeat it another seven times before they actually understand it. And there's a lot of repetition. But if, if you don't know who you are and what you stand for and who you're trying to serve, it becomes a lot harder to show your team what you're trying to do. Because people will typically make judgments based on your actions, not your intentions. I might judge myself. My intention is to do this. But if you see me doing something else, my intention is to drop 20 pounds. But I saw Dan eating Burger Priest like three days a week. Maybe Burger Priest will call you now, Mark. Hey, there's my <laughs> sponsor. My only sponsor. <laughs> right. So I think a lot of it has to be the clarity that we're providing to the team, the, the alignment that we have with who we're trying to serve. Um, and then and then going after that, that like Steph mentioned, Jim's call, Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, and they talk about that. A lot of companies try to go like a mile wide and just very shallow because I can serve a bigger audience, but you're actually not really serving who you think you're serving in that regard. So if you can narrow your focus and you can just drill down deeper mm -hmm. on that, then you can probably do a better job of serving those people because you can better understand them. If I, super well said, Dan, if I, if I kind of, now, I haven't read Good to Great in like a decade, so bear with me, but I think the concept you're referring to is the hedgehog concept, when they compared Walgreens to a competitor and what products they were offering and staying within your core competency drove. Mm. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. You haven't read that in a decade and you remember that. It's not it's too good bad. For you. And, yeah. and, 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 and to your first <clears throat> point, Dan, that I think that book talks about is getting the right people on the bus and sitting in the right seat. Yes. Right? And, and you're trying to create a leadership environment that gives clear expectations and aligns people in the right spot. And if they're not, then let's address that. Yeah. Ultimately, you need to be aligned with not only what you do here, but what we're trying to serve and what we're trying to do with our patients. Um, yeah. Well said. So, Pat, just before I challenge Dan on something here, <laughs> right? Welcome to my podcast. I'm going to test you now. <laughs> Is it how great the Red Wings are? Because they're pretty great. Yeah, we're not the last few years, though, like I'm just saying, <laughs> two years ago, two years ago, the Habs were in a Stanley Cup final and oh, when, the playoffs. when was, never mind. When was the last year they won the cup though? Not important right now. Pat, <laughs> your, your thoughts from, from your perspective, what kind of leadership culture are you trying to instill within the practice? Um, honestly, I, I think the first step in trying to be in a leadership role is know thyself. Um, okay. And I, I think we spent a lot of time and, and this is where, you know, Patrick Lencioni's work and all the stuff that Dan's listened to has been of immense value. I think to all three of us, but to me personally too, and I'm still working on myself, is trying to figure out, okay, like Dan kind of alluded to, and I won't do a deep dive in it, but, you know, everybody's got, you know, two geniuses, two competencies and two frustrations and knowing what they are and why you react to certain scenarios. Because if you're leading people and you think you come across a certain way, but you don't in reality becoming more aware of how those two things align over time, I think is really important for any leader. So it's almost like before you start working on other people, figure yourself out first, man. Um, and I think that's a really important part. And I'm still working on that. And it's it's, it's probably going to be a lifelong process because I need a lot of work. But, <laughs> we but, all do. Right. But I think the other uh, analogy, and Dan, Dan and Steph will laugh when I bring this up, but it's the, um, the matrix analogy the whole neo and morpheus analogy and Steph just step just laughs she's like yep because it's one of those things where it's like once we understood our personality profiles it actually made a lot of, a lot of sense i mean dan will always joke and go i just told patrick something and oh crap he went and did it and Steph's like what did you tell him so it's like it's like realizing the dynamic between the three of us 
but doing it in a way that's not accusatory or destructive, but saying, I, I understand why you behave that way. How can we harness that in a positive way for the company? And now that you're in that position, now you're in a position maybe to lead other people. Um, so I, th I think it's having that awareness. And I, and I really appreciated when we were going through the core values review, which is uh, adaptability, curiosity, and accountability, which is people often throw out things like honesty. And I'm like, they're they're pay to play values. Like you should be honest. <laughs> like, it's it's not like that should, so it's, it's what are the unique things that brought your company to be where it is now? It was because we were naturally curious about things. We were willing to be held accountable. We might get our backs up, but we're willing to be held accountable. And then there's the adaptability going, something's changed. How do we pivot? COVID's a great example of that. Um, so, so I think, I think um, my first advice to anybody else is uh, first of all, don't go to somebody for don't don't take a criticism from somebody that you wouldn't go to for advice and when you find that person look their brain for knowledge uh, because always assume the other person knows something that you don't i think be humble love it i i, I just right from the beginning the know thyself piece is like it's super critical because like how do you lead other people when you don't even know how you show up to the people you're trying to lead yep. you know? and, and for anyone listening to this if you haven't done a 360 review Google it, figure out how the process works. It will remind you that you always have work to do. I, I've been doing them for, you know, I was lucky, right? I worked for companies like Roots, Steph, TELUS. I love them. They're <laughs> fantastic. Right? Roots, TELUS, uh, you know, Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, um, Bata, um, Fusion, like companies that had this discipline in place for their leaders. And my 360s, they've just been this lifelong progression of, okay, getting better at that, getting better at that, that's a strength. Oh my God, I'm still terrible at that. <laughs> and becoming less terrible each time. Like, so if you can do a 360, do it, because I'll give you an example. The one I still would get today, still would get today if I did one and I was working for somebody else. It would be way easier than running your own business, by the way. But if I was working for someone else, I can guarantee you, um, negative body language. And yet the rest of my 360s is like super positive, enthusiastic, makes you feel empowered. But when he's pissed off, he doesn't have to say a word. But because I withdraw, because that's my way of being angry, because I feel like I've developed, because I don't say, fuck off, you're all stupid. What's wrong with you? Because that's what I want to do. <laughs> now I just sit there and I go, but but that's the progression, right? And and you talk about knowing thyself. Sometimes you have to know you're still weak at something. Yep. You still <laughs> have to work on it. So again, if you haven't done a 360 and you're listening to this, Google it, call me, I'll steer you in the right direction. Make sure you have a big bottle of wine before you review your results because it's emotionally damaging when you think you're perfect and you find out in the eyes of everyone around you, you're not. <laughs> Um, but it's a great way to identify gaps in your leadership style. Steph. Well, I think like that's also important too. Like, again, I, I totally agree with the know thyself concept because like, that's how my journey really started, like I said, but um, like looking at it and saying there's been moments, there have been times that like, I'll be, I'll be talking to Dan and I'm like, I need to just not, I need to not engage with people today because I can't hide this. Like, I am so frustrated or so mad and it's not fair to them to have to see it because it's not at them, right? It might be at a circumstance, but I think it's also about understanding that like at a certain level of leadership that your emotions and your actions can have a lot of detrimental effects like down the line, right? So to a point there's being honest and being vulnerable and, and showing people who you are. And then there's also the aspect of leadership where like people look to you for support and guidance and and knowing that things are going to be okay, right? And if I'm if I come out and guns a blazing with a flamethrower and go like everything is going to hell, like it's not going to do anybody any favors, right? Um, and so I think it was one time Dan had a clinic day, and so he was like, "Okay, like you're not in a good headspace right now." I was like, "I'm not in a good headspace." He's like, "I need you to promise me that you will not call anybody." <laughs> I was like, "I won't call anybody today. I will sit at my computer and I will do my work." That I need to do because I, I can recognize that as much as I might want something to change, that I'm going to be destructive in how I go about it. Yeah, at least being right? self-aware that you know the problems there. You haven't figured out how to fix yes. it yet, but you know it's there, yes. so you got to you got to divert from what you're doing. Yeah, and then the next day I can be like, okay, 
Good. I've come. And Dan and I have this phrase where it's like, we will always come back to everything is our fault. Because ultimately, we are the leaders and we are the ones that can make changes. We are the ones that hold the accountability to actually make the changes. Uh, I'm <laughs> that one down. So everything is Steph's fault? No, you said all Everything of- is Steph's <laughs> fault. No, just me. Yeah, just, yeah. No, but in um, all seriousness, I'm writing that down because um, the organizations that I see that have consistent long-term success have leaders who have that characteristic. Because the easiest thing is to blame the staff and turn them over. Yeah. yeah. Hold on. What kind of environment are you creating? And then the, yep. and the last piece, I wanted to go to Dan because he, he, he had something to add there just earlier. So hope you haven't lost the thought. But I had Richard Petty as one of the first guests on this podcast. He was my CEO at MLSE. And it was exactly what you were saying, Steph. I said, Richard, how did you do it? Like, Because Richard had a high profile position, was in the media. Every time the teams lost, it was Richard Petty's fault. They would fly planes above the Air Canada Center that said, fire Richard Petty. And in-house, everybody loved the guy. He was a great leader. People respected him. He knew the staff by name. And we're not talking 10 staff. We're talking thousands of staff when you had the arena staff. And he'd spend time. And I said, it had to have bothered you. And on the podcast, because we never talked about it at work, he, it hurt. Like it, like, it hurt me. Like, of course that hurt. Um, but what am I going to do? We're going to go in the office and show everybody? He goes, so I'm going to reflect because everyone's looking at me and I got to find the spot to deal with that hurt. Yeah. It's not in front of my people. And I think that's what you yes. just acknowledged in, in your way. Dan, sorry, you were going to add something. Well, I have three things that I'd like to say. Time to be able to do it. One, how do you get? If you weren't a Red Wings fan, I'd give you three. You can have one and a half things. <laughs> one and a half. Oh man, which ones do I want? You can have my one and a half too. So I get one and a half. If you want a half, so you can have mine. You beat us. You beat us this year, so you can have all three. You can have all three. So the, the first thing I was going to be a question for you is like, how do you get your three sixty reviews now? I would assume it's Jody, but is that just not marriage then? And so you get daily 360 reviews. It's not a, it's not a 360, though. It's like, what would that make it? What's a straight line? What was that? Yeah, 180. Yeah, 180. Yeah, 180. yeah there's, no need, to, there's um, no need to submit that survey. Hey, you don't give her feedback. She just gives yeah. you feedback. <laughs> The second thing was that like Jim Collins talks about that in good to great as well. The the person who looks in the mirror versus the person who's looking out the window, the leader basically and saying like, no, we didn't set the right things, but it was the concept that, that we looked at and understood before we even read the book or anything like that was we could always trace it back. And I think that self-reflectance of, you know, we either didn't set the expectations properly. We didn't provide the right resources or training. We, they didn't understand. We didn't follow up with it. Something along those lines to be able to go there there's just something that we could have done better to be able to equip the team to execute what our plan was basically right um and then the the third thing was i just wanted to add one other leader and i've never met the man but it's steve eiserman i think he changed his game oh here we go really offensive <laughs> player to a selkie winner to help detroit win the stanley cups and now he's rebuilding the Detroit Red Wings to be another championship level team after doing that in Tampa Bay. I hope to, I don't think I ever want to meet him because I heard the phrase, you don't want to meet your heroes type of thing. Um, but I think Steve Eiserman was one of those types of guys that I was like, when everybody else was a Mario Lemieux or Wayne Gretzky fan, there was something about Steve Eiserman that drew me to him basically. So Yeah, well, I think I'll have to give you this. Next one. client. I'll have to give you this one when it comes to Stevie Y. I I have a ton of respect for the guy. Um, he has strong enough awareness skills and people skills to put himself in situations to allow teams to win. So to your point about signing up to the defensive role versus the offensive, and even as a general manager, look at the leadership he put in place in, in Tampa Bay that I'm sure he's trying to do. Is he in Detroit now, Dan? Yeah. He's trying to do in Detroit. But anyways, no, but he, he gets it. He can read the situation and read people and get those complementary skills to make teams win. You mentioned Wayne Gretzky. Wayne Gretzky was a coach for all of eight and a half seconds with Arizona, I think. Why? Because he's so elite. Mm. He can't teach other people to be Wayne Gretzky. Because he can't get to a place that says, I've got a repeatable performance that says, okay, let's say he had an Austin Matthews on his team. He could probably talk to Austin Matthews in his mindset. But you can't talk to Brendan Gallagher the same way. It's, it's, but your leadership style has to get the same performance out of those people. And, and Stevie Y seems to be that type of person who can say, I've got a process, I've got a skill set. Now I'm going to make that work across a different amount of people who are different people with different skill sets 
to drive to the common result. And I see you guys working through that in your practice. And, and I certainly think it's starting to pay off. Um, okay, let's have some fun now. We got like 15 minutes left. <laughs> I love that you're being also a professional and you should be a professional clinic. I shouldn't joke and tease, but tell me about your biggest fuck up ever as a leader. <laughs> <laughs> Pat, again, we only have 15 minutes left. I know, I know. I'm like, where do I start? Um, <laughs> and, and most importantly, what did you learn from it as you share the example? I'll go first on this one, if that's all right. <laughs> okay. Please do. Um, Get it out of the way, Pat. Well, let's just say my nickname. <laughs> that way I don't have to. Well, let's just say in the, like, um, I have been referred to as Fire Pat. That should say it all. Um, yes, true. Um and I think what it ties into, and I'll like my biggest screw ups have been, I think, and I think it does go back to like your working geniuses, your frustrations, your competencies. When when you just operate to your geniuses, no matter what, you literally just plow ahead, and you're you're completely blind to what else is going on. And I think this is kind of before Dan came on board, but myself and Steph would be there, and Steph is like a master discerner, so she can I can give her ideas and she'll percolate them, come back to me with options. But it was like, we never really had that big picture. Like, why are we doing this in the first place? And we would just do things and they would get done really efficiently and really, really well, but we didn't really know why we were doing them, but we just kept doing them anyway. <laughs> and I think what, um, you know, when, when you have a whole troop of your staff come to you and go, yeah, so we're thinking about quitting on mass. Mm. Let, let me tell you, that is a kick in the rocks for any person who thinks they're a leader. Um, and I think when, when you hit that stage, and you're looking anywhere else but in the mirror, you're looking in the wrong place. And I think that's where it's like, okay, something's got to change. We, we've got to start thinking about things differently. Now, this is before we you know, had Patrick Lencioni's model and his widget model and everything else. But I think now that we've, uh, and we're still, it's still going to be a journey. It's always going to be a journey. But I compare where we are now compared to where we were five years ago. It's not even close. Like we are so far ahead from a leadership perspective. And I think it's more also having the humility to say, Hey, maybe I'm not the right person to be in that chair in the company. Maybe uh, I'm better. Maybe I'm better serving in this chair in the company. And I think that's where, um, everybody has an ego, but when you, when you come from a background from a academia and like do my PhD, which, which I fondly refer to that now as poor homeless and destitute or, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, it, it's, it's our piled high and deep, sorry, but I'm going to go there. Um, if when you're an academic, it's very structured and egos are very much a part of the academic world. And for a reason, cause you're applying for grants, your reputation is important and stuff like that. But you take that, uh, academic world, which is, I'm not belittling it. I'm saying it, it, it is what it is, but you take that mentality into the business world. It's suicidal, mm. um, because you're just going to destruct all around you. And I think it's, it's taken me years to sit back and go, okay, take the military background, take the academic background. And maybe I'm a bit of a rare duck because I've taken a sidestep into the business world. And it's like, okay, so I have, I, have I bitten off way more than I can chew? And I think in the beginning, yes. And I think learning that lesson in humility as I'm getting older. Yeah, humility is everything as a leader. And, and you've got to constantly revisit that because we get sucked back into the trap. It happens all the time. Yep. You want to talk about humility in my business? I'll be like, back to Jody. We'll be talking about the business. She's joined it. I'm like, don't worry, we got it. We got like freaking six months of client. We can buy another house and three more cars. And then three months later, as you're working with those clients, you go, holy shit, babe, we got to get rid of one of the cars. And I'm not sure the kids are going to be able to play hockey. And I don't know, maybe we should get an apartment. And then, and it's <laughs> up and down, right? Because it keeps kicking you in the ass. And the reason I share that story is once you're aware of it, you're empowered. Yeah. You know what to do differently to not let it happen again. And the waves are let, they're reduced. They're easier to manage with those issues that you have as a leader. So I thought that was a great share. Okay, I'm not letting Dan or Steph up the hook here. And then we'll talk about some of the things you're most proud about. Um, Dan, biggest screw up. There's a lot. Um, but I think ultimately it, it's one scenario where we had um, – an employee who um, we ended up having to let go. Um, and the rest of the team was didn't see it coming. They didn't know why it happened. We had good reasons for it to happen. Um, and they all kind of individually grabbed, like Steph and I mainly, and said, like, 
are we, are we like, is this something we can expect? Like, are, are we getting fired? What's going on? And literally the response was, have you heard from us? And they said, no. And I'm like, well, then why would make you think that you would get fired? But they were really saying there was an absence of communication. They didn't know where they stood at all. And ours was like, well, if we didn't tell you, you suck. You should just assume you don't suck. Well, because in this instance, we had a lot of communication with the employee that we let go. She knew where she stood because we communicated it and Nobody she else knew did. she was on thin <laughs> ice. And we really only talked to people when there was something wrong. <laughs> so you haven't heard from us. Everything must have been going well. Yeah, that, 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 that was, it hurts. Yeah, it hurts a lot. So I don't know if that's Steph's story too. No, it's not. <laughs> like that great example that's that's the whole piece about the emotional bank account that we talk about in the training right is like how many positive things are you saying so people don't jump to the negative when you got to take that withdrawal and that negative feedback and it's it's everybody's perception around you as you do it as well but they trust there's a reason for that if, if i was in trouble i'd know we have a process they talk to me regularly I'm well just- and there, there's somebody steph will probably remember the i don't remember whose analogy this was but they talked about um, trust with your team is more like a water balloon. And mm. sometimes as leaders, you think that like, if you break their trust, you just poked a little hole and there's a little stream of water. But what you actually did is you burst the entire balloon. So it doesn't take very much to shatter what trust you had with them because you, you essentially hold a lot of their life vulnerabilities in your hands, right? If you can, if you have the power to hire or fire people, and you could fire people for potentially any unreason and you don't communicate with your team, they could be thinking the worst because from, from an evolutionary standpoint, they're trying to protect themselves too. And they're going, I need to survive. I need to pay my bills. I need a place to live. I need to eat food. I need to do all this. If I get fired from my job, like, what does this mean? Right. And instead of just like talking with your team and telling them they're doing a good job and like, Hey, that's fantastic. You're a really valued member. Right. It doesn't take a whole lot of effort to do that. And sometimes I think, the excuse I think I told myself was that we were so busy at doing other stuff, trying to grow the business, trying to, to become better at the business. It was at the expense of the people who were actually doing a lot of the work and their alignment with where we were trying to go, essentially. So we've had to turn that around entirely and go like, well, no, we need to be feeding into the team and they take care of the people. We take, we take care of them and then... Ideally, we're moving in the right direction. You both have referred to that quote, that, and you both said Simon Sinek. You, you've heard that from him before, right? Where he says, you're not yep. in charge. Yep. You're taking care of those in your charge. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I was in your leadership training. That's how things get done, right? Yeah. It's like, mm-hmm. focus all your energy on helping your team be successful and communicate so they know where they stand. And I think also Richard Branson's big on that. He's like, empower your team and they're going to take care of your customers basically. But, but I think one of the things that I want to mention briefly is that initial connection meeting. Like I've been doing that with the doctors and I find that like, you, I've learned a ton, like as Dan says, Oh, new concept, communicate with your team. Like when I'm talking to the doctors, I'm like, how do you like hey, to be? Hey, wait a second. I'm getting paid to train people. Out of <laughs> that's, a new concept, okay, that's true. That's true. Uh, Dr. Mark. Mark's concept, right? That's right. Mark's, Mark's Mark's concept. Mark's concept. Mark's concept. I'm right here. That's right. It's Mark's Mark's concept. Concept. <laughs> <laughs> but when, but when like a simple, a question as, you know, um, if you, if you like to be recognized, how do you like to be recognized? If you like to be rewarded, how do you like to be rewarded? And we think we know the answers to that. And and the person will give you an answer that you completely do not, ex- do, do not ex- expect. It's, it's again, a lesson in humility about making assumptions about people, right? Absolutely. Steph, anything else you want to add from a negative, I screwed up perspective? Like you can only add one. I only have one, but it's probably the biggest one that any of us have, have done. Um, and my, my, like I said, at the very beginning of this, right, like that authoritarian thing, but ultimately it becomes what ended up happening was the devalue of people, right? Not realizing that, Pete, like again, to Dan's point, right, you can get so lost in the business and the numbers and the profitability and how much does a pen cost? Oh my God, can you believe how many pens we're using? This is ridiculous. <laughs> you can get so caught up in that um, and so fear driven based on on numbers and financials and all those kinds of things that you can de- start to devalue your people and it just becomes that. Um, like go just do your work. Just why aren't why aren't you producing more? Um, and so I think that was like I said back in back in 2016. That's what ended up happening um, to start this whole journey. And I think like what that made me realize and what we've learned and continuously learn and continuously get that that reinforcement of is your people are your biggest asset. Um, your people are your differentiator. Your people are the thing that that drive you, your company. Uh, you could have six companies that all have the exact same operating procedures and all of them have different people, and they're all going to have different results. Um, 
And so, you know, having the assumption that everybody in our team is always doing their best. Um, and if something's going wrong, what we said earlier, we haven't set the right expectations. Have we communicated with them to let them know that, hey, you know what, you're working really, really hard. Let's redirect that effort over, over this way. Um, and so I think really just trying to, you kind of sometimes need that kick in the pants of, again, like Patrick said, everyone's going to quit on mass to realize, hey, you know what, these people without them, this company doesn't exist. And we need to make sure that we're supporting them um, and helping them thrive and become their best selves, right? So. Yeah, and that's kind of when it, when I when I shared at the beginning, and it applies for all three of you. But I shared like you know your your strength with the numbers. Impressive to me, but what's more impressive is that you guys are understanding the behaviors that are driving those numbers, and mm -hmm. what you're talking to your team about isn't like we're down eleven percent on hits to the website. Third party consultant Petapog, get it up. It's like, hey, listen, that number is like, what are we doing? And what, what's an action plan and how can we improve that number and what can you do within your control and and that's the dialogue you guys are having with everybody in your team after we have those executive reviews that says here's where the business is at we talk about that for 10 minutes and then we go okay well how do we influence it and to your yeah. point earlier about we believe our people are doing their best that gets us to the point of owning it as a leader of why things aren't going well it's okay well what tool do they not have that we have to give them and then, yeah. yes, eventually you get people who aren't willing and there's people decisions you have to make because you've given them all the support you can give them and they're not producing. And that's what's going to change the number. But you guys look at it as it's always the last step. Um, and that's something that takes organizations 20 and 30 years of pain to learn. And you guys are learning it quickly. So kudos to you. Um, before we end this, because you guys have been awesome and it's been an hour and a bit, I want to leave you with two things. and then I I'll want... talk to you all day, Mark. Uh, we will continue after this, Steph. There'll be a second and third beer. Our, our normal Friday home is using. Um, <laughs> what I, what I want to do is I want to give one of you or all three of you, and maybe one of you can start, just tell the audience what you guys do, because I really think that's important, who your target demographic is and what your mission is. I don't normally do that on this podcast, but I don't think enough people know what the hell is available to them through what you guys are doing. Um, so I want you to finish with that, but I do want to leave you with two things. Well, only one thing. Thank you. So I tell this story with my other clients that I have my first KPI with my name on it. Thanks to you guys. I love that. I love yep. that. I love the pre pedophile yeah, but... and post pedophile. That's right. To my That's brain. Right. But by Joe, yeah, you're, you're a metric. You, you would think. Part of that's like, oh, that's my ego. It's actually, I love the fact that there's accountability as a consultant to you guys. You sold us on this stuff. You got us to buy in. We invested in you, Mark, and pay money on a contract. We're going to measure the crap out of this stuff and see if it's working. Thank God it went so far. <laughs> um, but thank you for giving me my first KPI ever. On that You're note- welcome. I now I'm curious if either was like we're genuinely really excited about that, or if we went, we went back to Jody was like, oh my god, oh my god, this. <laughs> I'm walking down the hall. I have a KPI <laughs> name for me. <laughs> um, no, and uh, actually, there is another organization, but I'm not a KPI. I'm a like a, it's a pedophilism, They call it one of the logistics companies that I work with. Their sales team. Anyways, you're, you're a verb. <laughs> oh, trust me, I've been some worse verbs. Did you pedophile on this? Don't tell me you pedophile. Oh, you you pedophile on this? Pedophile? Did you? Oh my god. <laughs> um, what do you guys do? And 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 why should people care? And 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 what and and give us like a two minute summary of like what you guys are doing because I think it's phenomenal. Who's gonna go? Damn. Um, so it, it's a lot, Pat had alluded to a little bit of it in the beginning is that, um, we, we teach brains how to use eyes, but that usually is a conversation starter where people go, that sounds amazing. What do you do? Um, and everybody can, has generally had an eye exam so they can visualize what I'm talking about if they can't see what we're doing, but usually you go to the eye doctor and you cover one eye and you try to read small letters from far away. And then you cover the other eye and you try to read letters from far away. And if you can't read them, usually glasses can help you to get sharper distance acuity. Um, but what we really deal with is typically patients more on the pediatric side, children that are struggling, particularly with near point tasks, meaning it's within an arm's length. So reading, writing, computer work, 
uh, tablet work, that sort of stuff, where learning is becoming an issue. The kids really struggling in school. And like Pat had said before, typically these are like really bright kids. We talk to the parents and, and say like, when you talk to your excuse me, when you talk to your child, like, do they understand what's going on? And unless they have auditory processing issues, they typically do. And they're like, yeah, but I try to get them to read a book or to write stuff or they're, okay, they're copying from the board and their handwriting's all different sizes and spaced poorly and all this other stuff. A lot of times those are different types of visual skills that are not evaluated during a routine exam. And so what I usually tell people is, all of that's very important. You need to see far away, particularly if you can drive a car, right? You need to see far away. Um, but I don't know anybody that holds a book 20 feet away from them. And so when you start to bring that stuff in close, it requires your brain to coordinate your eye movements, team the eyes together, focusing skills, all sorts of stuff so that you see one single clear object to get the information into your brain to give your brain half a chance to start to understand what you're even looking at. So if you can't do that, and like Pat said, we can't see these things. Sometimes you can. There's some people that have eye turns, or business is what it's called, where one eye is pointing a different direction than the other eye. We're not talking about obvious signs like that. These look completely normal kids that are struggling in school and they can't figure out why. Oftentimes they're on individualized education plans and the teachers have to give them extra help at school. Sometimes they need extra tutoring. They've done all these things for years. It doesn't seem to be happening. And they get in our chair and we evaluate and say like, yeah, your kid doesn't know how to use their eyes worth a hill of beans. And then the parent usually cries and says, we've been struggling for years. How come nobody told us about this? And it was the same thing that you said, Mark, when you started consulting with this, you're like, you guys have an amazing business that nobody knows about. And it's hard to get the message out there because it's kind of complex. And we're doctors and we're trained like doctors to talk like doctors. So when we talk to people, we talk like doctors and they go, I don't know what you said, but you sound passionate about what you do. Mm -hmm. Right. And so what we do is we help these kids understand how to use their eyes, just like an occupational therapist or physical therapist might help kids to be able to gain mobility issues, or gross motor, eliminate gross motor concerns or speech language pathologists can help them to better phonetically understand things. We help them how to use their eyes and, the world's kind of visually based. So if you can't use your eyes, you're you're kind of up a creek without a paddle. Steph wants to add something. So mm. yeah, it's kind of just going back to that that frustration point from parents. Like I used to book the initial phone calls. Um, and I would talk to parents. I would talk about struggling and my kid doesn't read and this is that and school's going this way. And I would talk to them and it became so common in what parents would say to me that I eventually started using it and asking parents, like, is this how you feel? And it was my kid just asked me why they're stupid and I know they're not stupid. They, they just test badly. And it was that concept of, I, I can talk to my child and I know they're intelligent and I know they retain information, but they don't test well. And one of, one of our patients her what actually triggered her, um, to book a, and her son finally walked up and said, mom, why am I stupid? Mm. And she, she's like, I just cried. And I was like, you're not like, you're so smart. You just, you, you have, a barrier, a visual barrier that is stopping you from being successful. Um, and, and he's, he's doing phenomenal now. Uh, and he's doing a, a, an absolutely amazing job and he's acing all of his tests and like to look at that. And that's why we all got into this, right? Like there, we all have different, different stories of that stuff. Like, and, and, but just talking to parents and having them just absolutely heartbroken because we all want the best for our kids and to, to hear parents having that struggle and to know what it's like to be that kid who's just kind of faking it until they make it right um is is something that we would really like to try to abolish honestly if we could um and so just giving giving the kids that that are teaching them the rules to the game basically is how patrick usually says it right like if you if if you're he always uses the chess analogy which i cannot ask him to say because he'll say it much better than i will but go ahead pat chess analogy teaching the rules to chess no, you, you always, yeah, he's like, I have no idea. Um, no, but you would always say, like, if I know how to play chess and you don't, Obviously, and yeah. I challenge you to a game of chess, who's going to win? Yeah, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, I know the rules. You don't know the rules to the game, and I'm asking you to play it, yeah. right? So we teach, the, we teach kids the rules to the visual system so they can actually play the game and ideally win. Add anything you wanted to add? Well, I, I mean, I think this is where, you know, what I love about what we're doing is, you know, it, it ties into my passion because I remember how it felt. And this is where I'll give a shout out to my older brother. He's about two years 
older than me. He, he read to me for three years in school. That's how I got through from probably about age nine to like 12. And he's still my hero to this day. And I, and I still think, like when I think back about everything that Steph just said and the chess analogy, it's like, how the hell can I play your game? I don't even know the rules. I don't even know what the game's about. And I'm trying to survive in a classroom. You do start to develop that 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 failure mentality. Oh, here's another thing I can't do. Why should I bother trying? And I was lucky enough to be surrounded by an environment with my brother and with, you know, we ended up, long story short, I ended up getting the issue semi-fixed and then I kind of fixed it over time as well. But I was, I was one of the lucky ones. And I kind of look at it as a, almost as a, as a, as a, as a duty to society that we need to start getting these issues more in front of parents because the doctors can care, but nobody cares more about that kid than the parents. And I think getting this way, getting this information in front of parents in a way that they can understand and they can process. And as Dan alluded to as doctors, we think we're fantastic. Steph, Dan, how many years did I whiteboard in front of parents going, I got all the, and the parents like, I have no idea. He sounds really passionate. No idea what he's talking about. We literally had to, Right. So we literally <laughs> had to bring in a consultant to say, here, here are ways you can show parents what it's like to have the problem. You need to give them what we call the mask, but give them, give them the feeling of having the problem, having the information so they understand it. And I think, you know, for years I used to, I used to say, why don't these parents treat these kids? And I used to think they were bad parents. And it was like, no, I, I was the person who was a crappy communicator. I didn't get it across in a way that the parent could understand it. And I think that was such an important um, again, you know, humbling experience where you start to realize, I don't care if you're a doctor, I don't care if you have a PhD, if you can't resonate with the parent, you're, they're not going to engage in your process. If, if some, if someone's a doctor and they put up an x-ray and they go, Hey, you know, your kid's got a fracture in the femur. There's no discussion about whether we're fixing it. We're fixing it. It's just a matter of how. And when I look at these issues, we have to make these issues so obvious to parents in a way they go, Oh my God, that's the reason why my kid's not succeeding. Thank you. And that's the barrier that we're trying to break down. And I think we're doing it slowly, but through Steph's awesome, just analyzing all the numbers on everything, we can just go to her and go, Hey, I wonder about this. And Steph's like, I can tell you this, this, and this, and this, and this. And we're like, cool. Right. So, so it's, so for me as, as, as a clinician academic, because I still love the academic side, that's awesome. You've got, you, you, we've got access to all those metrics that we can use to improve the system. But as you said, Mark, we understand the behaviors that drive the metrics now, which is really, really important. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll just add to all three of your feedbacks of, about what you do, and, and I'll leave you with a couple of things. For those of you who are listening to this podcast and you're not seeing the video, uh, you didn't see them tearing up as they were talking about it. I did. Um, and one of the things I see when I work with them, I did a role play once, like a role play, and I was in tears. And it's just because I'm going through, you know, my son had to go on an IEP, and I didn't know this existed. And the emotion I'm having is I remember feeling like the same way, like he's a smart kid. Like he does all this stuff. This None of this makes any sense. And, and that was almost a conflict point with my ex was like, no, no, he's fine. And, and little did I know he was fine, but there was a challenge that no one could open the door to help him close that challenge away. And I'm going, man, I miss that as a parent. And I got upset and not upset, but emotional, just thinking about that impact. Um, the other thing I'll tell you about these three, and this is not a shot at any of my other clients, they all do valuable work, let's be clear. Even if I had roots, I would say, <laughs> um, maybe I'll make a nice quality. <laughs> but, but what I will tell you is when I asked you guys what you wanted to do, and I got into my strategic planning process, and let's set financial targets and our five-year goals and break it down by profitability, and your answer was, we want to graduate 10,000 patients. I'll never forget that answer from you guys. Never. Um, now, the only way you can get there is running a good business because you need doors open, you need employees, you need to be able to pay bills to reach more people. That was Your answer was never, I want to have 27 clinics and I want a boat and I want a nice car. And trust me, I know I, I, you guys would love to have a canoe right now if I could give you one. But <laughs> the point being... That's um, success with markpetapaw.com. Yeah, right? <laughs> I'm really doing myself a great service right now. Really Dan's driving your business, old, trying to get you a yeah. canoe. Um, Dan's 15-year-old Maxima. Yeah, it was, but it was <laughs> always about the patients and continues to be today. And even the behaviors you're putting in with your leadership process are helping your team impact the patient. Don't lose sight of that. So if any of you have heard this, like any of you, Anyone out there heard this podcast? Hello, hello. You know, I told Pete Burness when she was on it, like her fame was going to go to another level after my podcast. It was all this podcast. You can quit TSN and Raptors basketball. You can That's right. My podcast. Um, 
But for those of you who are listening to this and you see either you know your child may be struggling with that or you know someone who does, I strongly recommend you talk to these people. Having said that, it's my pleasure to work with all three of them on most days. Um, sorry, I'm just kidding. <laughs> really most days, all days. Um, and you should check them out. Guys, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it. Oh, hi. <laughs> Brilliant. Again, for those of you who are watching the video, Ken ends with a picture of Stevie Y holding the cup. Was it Stevie nice. Y? Yeah. Yeah, well. <laughs> well, let's just leave it there. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thanks Mark. Mark.